Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Neil Parekh, executive producer of the of Sri Sunday New York Times Read Along. We have a great guest planned for today, Trish Hall, former editor of the New York Times op-ed page and author of Writing to Persuade, an insider's look at the New York Times op-ed page. Of course, Sri Srinivasan is our host. He's been hosting the show for about five years, or actually more than five years, and uh, we'll get going in just a minute. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Please share this live stream. Please tag your friends, uh, comment, and, and of course, let us know where you're watching from. And without further ado, we'll bring in Sri uh, Srinivasan. Sri, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. You're still uh, out in Fire Island, right? That's right. We've been here for a couple of weeks and we should be here for another few days. And we've had multiple shows from Fire Island in the past. Uh, past summers, we've uh, had great guests here. This time, because of social distancing, I'm not asking any of my neighbors to join us. But one of the guests we had, you remember, is John Zaccaro Jr., the son of, uh, of, of, of the former presidential candidate, um, and it was just a, a, a vice presidential uh, candidate, vice, Geraldine Ferraro. Vice presidential candidate. He's the mayor of this town, and he's done a great job forcing us all into uh, isolation as much as possible and wearing masks. It's so good to be in a town where almost 95, 98% of the people I see are wearing masks. It's a very small town, but it's good to see that. That's good. That's good. We have uh, uh, folks already checking in. Jonathan Borstein from Union Square. I'm still trying to figure out how he always gets the first comment in uh, when we go live. I'm not sure what his secret is, but uh, he's been uh, a very loyal watcher. Uh, and he's been and watching my own. daily COVID show for nine, for 115 straight days, including on the show that he was able, we brought him on as a guest on the 100th episode. And so he's been fantastic. Tim Sohn is joining us from uh, Pennsylvania. Laura Silverman from Philadelphia. Diane Stefani from Margate, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and we have uh, Doug Levy uh, waking up early in uh, uh, San Francisco. Uh, Doug, thank you for joining Very us. Early. It's what, 5.30 his time. Um, and of course, uh, my mom joining us from uh, Hastings on Hudson, New York. Uh, hi, mom, thank you for, for uh, joining. Uh, and from LinkedIn, we have Peter Evans uh, joining us from Toronto. Uh, so it shows that we, we do have that uh, audience on, on LinkedIn, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Chris Gorman joining us from New York City, former colleague of yours, right? Um, yes. Oh, we have the answer. Uh, Jonathan is telling us how he does it. It's magic. <laughs> He's magic. Uh, we have... Dr. Sajana Chandrasekhar uh, joining us as well, uh, one of the co-hosts of She's On Call, uh, this great new live stream that uh, our team produces at 11 a.m. on uh, uh, Sundays, just after the New York Times read-along. Uh, this week is going to be a greatest hits, right? That is right. And uh, everyone, please tune in at 11 a.m. Eastern for She's On Call. You can find it on Facebook at She's On Call, Twitter at She's On Call. And we have uh, uh, Phil uh, Boten from uh, Toronto as well. Uh, and Patricia Freudenberg, again, one of our regular viewers on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you for joining us, Patricia. Always good to see you. Um, and uh, we have uh, a number of other folks. Uh, Janine, is it uh, Janine uh, Geis also joining from LinkedIn? Uh, so this is a, this is a great, uh, great turnout so far. So definitely encourage everyone to share uh, this broadcast, please make sure you uh, uh, share it on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on LinkedIn. You can mention your friends. Um, and for folks who are watching uh, the video, uh, I want to just encourage you to click play on the actual video. Um, if you're watching it uh, in your stream, uh, you and if you comment, we won't see your comments. Or if you're watching on a share, uh, so you have to actually watch it on the on the um, uh, actual feed uh, so that we can show your comments. I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, we are live every Sunday, uh, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. 
And uh, we, we have great guests that, that come to us uh, and join us for, uh, as Shri likes to say, reading the New York Times uh, like crazy people um, out loud and commenting on it. But it's been a, a great show uh, so far. So uh, what I'd like to do, Shri, is to, to tell folks a little bit about our production team and, and let folks know how we put this show together. Um, we have, uh, it, it certainly takes a village to do a show like this. Um, and we have, uh, in addition to Shri and myself uh, as the host and executive producer, uh, we have uh, a team of producers that helps uh, pull the show together. Uh, Paula Kiger, uh, you can follow her at Big Green Pan. Uh, Steve Taylor at Steve Derive. Uh, Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks and Carla Baranakis. Uh, at C-A-B-A-R-A, -A -A, at Kabara. Uh, and in particular, um, you know, the roles that, that they play uh, in terms of making this happen, uh, Paula uh, usually is in, sitting in our Facebook group, in, uh, responding to comments, um, providing context, uh, adding links to the stories we're talking about. Uh, Steve Taylor does the same in LinkedIn. Uh, Julia Weeks has been our medical segments producer and uh, uh, filling in for folks uh, as necessary. And, and when we have, when we stream to other channels, she's been able to um, uh, provide links and context there. And Carla Baranakis has, has done some great work, uh, primarily in helping to uh, book some great guests, including, including today's guest, uh, Trish Hall, uh, again, the uh, former editor, uh, former editor of the New York Times op-ed page as you'll see in just a few minutes. Um, so thank you, Carla, for uh, doing that. Um, really makes a, a, a huge difference to have someone uh, with her experience at the New York Times on the continuous news desk uh, as the national uh, uh, copy chief. Um, Carla brings a wealth of experience uh, to this team. So thank you, thank you for that, Carla. Um, and uh, Shri, in addition to our great uh, production team, we also have some sponsors that we'd like to, to recognize. Uh, so if you can go ahead, uh, we'll first, uh, if you can talk about uh, your project with Muckrack. Sure, I'm, I'm delighted to be an advisor to Muckrack and they put together this Fundamentals of Social Media course. It's a free certification available to everyone in the world and 4,000 people have signed up already. mrac.co slash social mrac.co slash social. It's aimed at anyone who wants to get better at social media. I learned a lot, as did my colleague, our colleague, Linda Bernstein, who helped produce this. So everyone, please check this out. Fundamentals of Social Media, free certification, now available, mrac.co slash social. Uh, thank you, Shri. And uh, one of our other sponsors that uh, I would like to recognize is Magic Bus USA. Magic Bus imagines a world where children break out of poverty and lead fulfilling, rewarding lives, contributing to their community and to the world around them. And as you can see in India, seven out of 10 adolescents do not have a higher secondary qualification. Six out of 10 youth do not have the soft skills necessary for employment. And three out of 10 girls are married before they reach the age of 18. Uh, so thank you to uh, uh, Magic Bus uh, for your sponsorship as well. And uh, in addition to uh, Magic Bus and Muckrack, uh, we also want to uh, recognize Strategy Focus Group. Uh, Strategy Focus Group is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. Thank you to Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider from Muckrack Pradnia Haldapur from Magic Bus USA and Ron Thomas from Strategy Focus Group for your support of the New York Times Read Along. And if you're interested in being a sponsor, please contact Sri Srinivasan uh, at Sri at Sri. His email is Sri at Sri.net or myself, Neil Parekh. My email address is Neil at Neil uh, And you can learn more about our sponsor, Sri, uh, at uh, the links we have to their websites. Um, they do some, some really interesting work, and you can find them at readalong.link slash muckrack, readalong.link slash magicbususa, and readalong.link slash strategy focus group. 
so please, we encourage all of our viewers to visit our sponsors and learn more about the great work that they, that they do. All right, so thank you very much, Neil. We'll get ready to read the paper and talk to Trish Hall. Ab absolutely. Um, so we have, uh, um, we'll, we'll bring uh, Trish Hall on uh, in just a second. And uh, again, uh, you're watching the New York Times read along. Uh, Shri is our host, I'm our executive producer. And uh, we are uh, lucky to have Trish Hall as our guest today. Uh, and without further ado, we'll bring on Trish. Hi, Trish. Hi. Good, Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. We're really grateful. Uh, appreciate it. You are someone who's had such a great impact in uh, in the New York Times, uh, uh, and now we get to hear from you. We also want to talk about your book. But before we do that, we start our questions always by saying, "How are you?" And how are you handling this pandemic? I'm very lucky. I'm fine, and I'm in a nice house with my husband and my daughter and my boyfriend. So I'm, you know, two dogs. We're we're lucky. And what, how your family, uh, extended family, everybody's okay. Yep. Okay, that's that's good to know. So uh, tell us about the what was it like to work at the New York Times, and also what is it like to see this paper laid out here in front of you. I don't know if you still get the print paper, but what does the print paper mean to you? Um, when I love print, a lot of my career at the New York Times was spent on weekly sections. And as hard as we tried to create a really good digital version of a print section, it was very hard to do. There's a sort of essential sectionness that's very hard to get digitally because digital is by nature a stream. But um, I stopped getting print, I guess, about six months ago. I had sort of cut it down to the weekends, and then I cut it out entirely. And mostly I did that because I, I read the Times a lot, and I read it on the app, and I read things as soon as they're posted. So when I would get the paper, I would think, I've read the whole thing. I'm just sort of creating pollution. Um, pollution is the wrong word for it, but you know what I mean? It just seemed like a waste of paper. But um, there is something different about reading the paper in print and there are times I, I miss it and I thought about getting it again. It's just that the app is so tempting when things are posted immediately that it's hard, it's hard not to read it. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette is watching from Seattle here, somebody who woke up at clearly 545 to be on the air, to watch us on the air here. What does it tell you about the newspaper that there are thousands of people every week who watch us read the New York Times out loud on Facebook and other platforms? I mean, I think print is special. And it's, again, there's been so many attempts to duplicate the experience digitally because digital is a great form as well. It has different advantages. and. But print is uh, the only real opportunity you have to see exactly what the editors thought was important and the balance they create and the mix they create. And that's really why I liked being a section editor. I started a number of sections at the Times, and there's something about deciding what, what you want the reader to encounter on the next page and the next and the next and how they fit together. That's really one of the most exciting parts about being an editor. And look at all these people watching early on West Coast time, Las Vegas, Terry Ann Thompson, wonderful journalist and colleague of mine at Columbia. She ran the Night Badget program, which many people will recognize, those of you in journalism. And we also had Andy Revkin watching. Andy, former huh? New York Times writer. And, and he says, Andy, uh, great. When I was, Andy wrote for op-ed when I was there. Oh, terrific. And he says, yeah. such important question these days about opinion writing and the Times. And so we'll talk about all of those with Trish Hall. Trish, tell us your years at the Times. Well, I started there in 1986 as a food reporter. Um, I had been at the Wall Street Journal where I covered food more as a business. At the Times, I covered it more as sociology. I was interested in what people's eating habits said about them, how eating habits were changing. I did some 
sort of classic food things and some recipe stories, but mostly I was interested in behavior and profiles and things like that. And um, then I went on to be the deputy editor of the food section and the editor of the food section. And then um, I left the Times and I went to Martha Stewart and I loved that. It was like a startup when media was just taking in all of these new forms. We started a radio show and a website in addition to the magazine. Um, it was an incredibly interesting time. Uh, after that, I freelanced for quite a while for both the Times and for Martha Stewart. And then I went back to the Times as the editor of Sunday Business. Uh, I started the escape section, which no longer exists. Um, I, I re sort of worked on Sunday Business on trying to make it more reader friendly. Um, I revamped the real estate section. And then I oversaw food and style and home. I oversaw all the feature sections. And then after that, it goes on and on because I was there a long time, um, I became the op-ed editor where I oversaw the daily op-ed department, but I also started the Sunday Review. Wow, what a career. Most of us would have thought that just being the food editor would be the, you know, the pinnacle and the stop there and there you just kept going on and on and on that's fantastic bill mitchell's watching from the boston area he was at pointer for many years pointer.org still a wonderful place to learn about the business of journalism as well as what's happening in the media industry so people should definitely check out pointer.org and bill was my editor there for many years uh great to have him watching from boston everyone who's watching right now this is a rare chance to learn about the new york times op-ed page but also to hear about how, how Trish thinks about writing to persuade and the importance of persuading. Persuasion is bigger than ever. And so please share this with your friends around the world. Just tag them in Facebook or share on Twitter. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. So any of those platforms, your friends and family will benefit from reading this and hearing this, and they can easily watch the recording, which will go live as soon as we're off the air. So thank you for sharing this as widely as you can. And let's look at her book. It's called Writing to Persuade by Trish Hall. And uh, it says here, my favorite job by far was being the New York Times op-ed editor. I read submissions every week from people who wanted to have their say from all political persuasions, all kinds of backgrounds. And Trish Hall books.com and her Twitter handle is Trish P. Hall. Trish P. Hall former editor of the New York Times op-ed page. So let's, uh, we'll talk about the book in a little bit. Trish, let's get to the paper. Uh, folks want to know what's happening. And this, there used to be a time when Saturdays were kind of quiet, but now there's uh, world shattering headlines and news every single day. So let's just, uh, before we get to the front page, I'd just like to do a tour of all the other sections and please speak up as you you know, your memories of any of them or anything that that jumps out at you. You said that you used to be at Sunday Business. So we'll look at that. They now have very striking graphics and color on the front of the Sunday Business section, don't they? They do. I mean, I think they remade it. Maybe it was two years ago. They brought in a, a new editor from uh, Bloomberg Business Week. I think he's done an amazing job. It's It looks well, of course, he, in cooperation with an art director, they redesigned it and um, he's brought in a great mix of stories. I really like Sunday business. It's not an easy section to do because business has a lot of breaking news and the reporters don't always have time to do the kind of features you need for that section. Well, what about this time for the video call? Put on your Zoom shirt. And they're talking about the importance of what people wear on camera. Are you doing a lot of these Zoom calls? I am, yes, because I work as a consultant now and I have two, I have individual clients, but I also have two big corporate clients. And of course they they have meetings and they have meetings on Zoom. So yes, I don't have a special Zoom shirt, but I've been thinking about it. <laughs> and uh, this is one of your former colleagues in the op-ed section and the opinion section of the New York Times, Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate. Uh, how is he to work with? Paul? I did not have the privilege of editing him because the columnists were edited by um, a particular editor. There were two, actually. Um, but 
I sort of worshipped him from afar for his incredible productivity on on his blog, in the paper, online, and uh, he's amazing. He never seems to take a minute off. I never really understood that. Yeah, and he's a serious professor as well. So, yeah. and this is a book, arguing with zombies, mm -hmm. and uh, and and we had, by the way, his uh, uh, another e economics professor, Joseph Stiglitz join mm -hmm. us on the New York Times read along a few weeks ago. So he was on the other side of this uh, of this uh, stream that day. And uh, here we go, red, white, and blue when you're black. Am I gonna celebrate July 4th? No. Mm -hmm. And uh, so using here, as you see, they're using illustrations. The Times started doing that a few years ago, didn't they? Well, they've always used illustrations, but they've, uh, digital has allowed them to do more with illustrations, more animated illustrations, but illustrations really came into a lot of use at the times when the feature sections were started in the 70s and a lot of the covers were illustrated then. They have a history of a lot of great artists working for them. And the Times also does these great interviews in these kind of franchises, right? Corner Office and the Q&A in the magazine and uh, also the Sunday routine, all of that. Tell me about the value of these kinds of interviews where they they have the kind of routine on a regular basis, they're trying to get behind the scenes. Well, when you start a regular column, as an editor, you really start a regular column for two reasons. You want you want readers to come back, that you want them to have something that they're looking forward to and something they're gonna think, I wanna read Corner Office this week, what does it say? And it also makes life easier for editors because then you have some, we called it furniture, but you have some fixed um, stuff and you know that you some of the space will be filled because if you were looking at totally empty pages day after day in a feature section, it would be very difficult. News is different because it's kind of being created all the time, right? But features take a different uh, approach to the world. So Corner Office is an amazing franchise that has been very popular for a long time, as have been some of the other Q&As. And, um, I think they're hard to keep doing well. They're really hard not to get um, feeling repetitive, but the ones that have survived I think, are, are very good. And people like them because they like getting to know these people they read about. Lonnie Bunch III is secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He was the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and then got promoted to the boss of all those museums and he's the subject of this q and I can't wait to read it. He is an inspiring leader. The great line here, he says, I would rather the museum be a place that takes a little risk to make the country better than a place where history and science go to die. And he describes in, the, uh, in his biography, autobiography, he talks about what it was like to take Donald Trump around the museum and how distracted and uninterested he was in anything. He was a little interested in the pop section, but uh, they still made him the head of the Smithsonian after. So that was interesting. Uh, for many people, a single garment is the thin wall between respectable employee and homebound slob is the continuation of that story. College is worth it, but being on campus isn't. And this is an interesting story. Do you have uh, students in your circle? Um. My daughter's older than the college age. I don't know a lot of college age students. I have, you know, friends and relatives with little kids. I think the the pandemic has been hardest on parents with young kids or even teenagers. It's 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 really frightening to think of them not going back to school. But there is an interesting story. Again, I read it on the app, so I'm not sure. I think it's in today's A section professors don't want to go back to school. A lot of them are older. So it might be fine for the even little kids to go back to school, but a lot of teachers aren't young. So there's really complicated um, risk factors in all of it. But I don't see how parents are going to survive if kids don't go back to school. And that's certainly something a lot of people are thinking about. Here's a book review. This is America. And they have Masha Gessen, and several other, Robert M. Gates and others, children's novels about freedom, all here in the book review. And uh, Arts and Leisure, 
we're just doing a quick tour before we look at the front page, our summer movie obsession. And I couldn't keep track of all the sections you had worked on. So please speak up if you have anything you'd like to say about any of these. We'll do a uh, in-depth look at the magazine a little later, but the cover story is enduring, uh, America's Enduring Racial Caste System by Isabel Wilkerson. And that's interesting because as Indian Americans, we care a lot about uh, where things stand with the, the caste system, which is in many ways uh, one of the original sins of the way India uh, came together as a civilization. Here is the Sunday Styles, an urban cowboy's message. Adam Hollingsworth learned how fast misinformation can spread. And so that's the cover here. And seizing control of her deems, this is Simone Sanders, who has become a top advisor to Biden by not being bashful. He was uh, working on the other Sanders campaign, Senator Sanders, Bernie Sanders campaign, and was very active on television. And the Metropolitan section is available only to print readers in the Northeast, uh, or maybe in just in, in, New York, in the New York area. So this is something that even if you subscribe to the print paper elsewhere in America, you likely will not see this print, this section. And uh, by the way, I grabbed the New York Post just to look at just to look at it. And uh, this is the cover story is about the girlfriend of Jeffrey Epstein and Kevin Spacey hanging out at Buckingham Palace when Prince Andrew took them on a private tour. And uh, this was an interesting moment for us in our family, Trish. Just uh, this weekend, we saw the usual suspects with my children for the first time. And the question came up, should we watch it, knowing all the problems that Kevin Spacey had? And where do you kind of come down on the art and the artist being separated or together? Um, that's, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I do have... Uh, I had so many conflicts when I was in my bed with with people who felt like it was wrong to run the work of people they thought were bad in some way. And I think that's a complicated question because I think that a lot of people are bad in some way and we might not yet know what way. I'm, not, I, I'm uncomfortable being really judgmental about individual people. I guess I'd rather focus on systems and ideas. I think with so much focus on bad people, people forget that our biggest problems stem from these, you know, institutionalized poverty and racism and sexism and, you know, the lack of daycare. And th there are things that concern me a lot more than deciding whether someone's a good person or a bad person. Um, that puts me pretty out of sync with the world now, I realize. But um, I, if I wanted to watch something, I think I would want to know whether that person had done things I don't approve of, but I'm not sure it would stop me from watching it. And this is, of course, an interesting uh, era when we see like HBO Max has uh, put on the shelf the uh, show, the Gone with the Wind movie that they were going to show and they said they'll bring it back but put some context on it as well so uh and also the other thing that we thought about as a family when we were watching the usual suspects one of my favorite films is that it was the work of so many people and so many artists not just one uh in even though he had a pivotal role but it's not just one artist that makes a movie so we did watch it but it gave us a chance to discuss it as well mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're almost done with all the different sections and uh, we will come back to Sunday Review because of the op-ed section there. And real estate, uh, tell us about the New York Times and the real estate section. People always love reading it. I mean, I loved working on real estate. I, I changed it from, it was sort of a mix of commercial and residential and I changed it to make it more focused on the user, the renter, the buyer and, um, I mean, I think commercial real estate is really important. It's shaped New York, but it's sort of a separate story. So that's sort of better handled in the business section. But I think um, when I first moved to New York, 
you know, walk along the street. This is when people weren't always talking into their phones, but they would actually be talking to each other. And people always seem to be talking about two things that I was also obsessed with, food and real estate. And so it was fun for me to be involved in both of those sections because it's how we live. It's what we do. It's how we keep alive. So with real estate, there's no shortage of ideas or stories to do because the city's always changing. The world's always changing. Real estate does some national stories online. Um, the print section only is distributed in, the, in New York. But it's um, we all have to be interested in real estate because we need a place to live. So for that reason, I think it's one of the most interesting things to write about. One of the things that I've been learning about is the cancel the rent movement. And yesterday on my WBAI show, I have a spin-off radio show, two hours, by the way, Trish, you haven't lived till you've been uh, the subject of a call-in show in New York City where the extreme left and the extreme right call in and chat about anything. And so we talked about the cancel the rent movement, mm -hmm. which is talking, and again, I want to, I was going to bring this up later, but why don't I ask this now? And I'm going to Let's see if we can be both be on camera and we can talk about this for a second uh, about the names of things and how much they matter. Do you? I have this theory that if it had been called cl uh, climate change from the beginning and not global warming, we'd be in a different place. Instead of being called cancel the rent, what if it was called adjust the rent or rent reform or forgive the rent or something like that, or even with defund the police, abolish the police versus reform the police remove funding from one place to another. Uh, talk about the value of words when you're trying to persuade, please. I mean, I really I, I really agree with you. I think it's an important thing. I had the same obsession with climate change, which global warming, remember when people were like, oh, global warming couldn't be real because it's cold today. And so it really was misleading. And of course, no single person controls how these things are called. A lot of them, the names uh, develop organically, but I think they make a big difference. And you see the same thing now with defund the police. It's not about having no police. It's not about having no protection. It's about defining protection differently and having a variety of service people take on different functions. And, you know, once things are in the culture and it's what things are called, there's not much you can do about it, but they do carry meaning. I mean, there was, um, there's been interesting social science research done on how bad Democrats are at naming things and using words and how clever Republicans have been and that Republicans have been good at kind of naming things and taking the story so that they have been able over the years to portray, let's say, portray immigrants as people who cause problems or criminals. And the Democrats have not done as well in most of the issues they care about with portray with using words to portray the people who make up these big issues that, you know, if instead if they refuse to engage in the Republicans' word choice and instead immigrants are farmers. I mean now it is becoming more obvious to people, I think, with the immigrants are frontline workers, that immigrants do so many essential jobs in this country. Finally, the word essential may help people understand it better. Thank you. And I, I do want to ask in terms of, oh, by the way, let's just look at some of the comments coming in here. Uh, I, I, Paula says that I struggle with the semantics of defund the police too. I think the reality is so much more nuanced than that. And so that's a very good point in terms of climate change, right? Every time it's cold, the president says, oh, what, you know, where's global warming? And there are other terms, right? Like the, that uh, I think the Republicans were better at death taxes, death panels, and, and okay. terms death like that. Is a great one. Death panels is a very famous one. I mean, that's just ridiculous, but it's stuck. They're really good at PR, I guess is the right word. And welfare queens, you remember that term used by Ronald Reagan. And so what do you think it is that, uh, and I've not read this research, I definitely want to find this research about the naming of things by by Democrats. Uh, what, is, what do you think is the reason why they're not as good at naming things? I wish I knew. Sometimes they just seem really stupid. I mean, I just, as a party, 
I, sometimes it, it, they seem not aware and sometimes they, they just don't seem tough enough. Um, choosing the right words isn't about being tough. So I don't know, I've, I've interviewed um, professors who have talked to them about word choice and talked to them about how to win over the public and they listen, but they don't feel like anything changes. So I honestly don't know why they're like that, but in some of, in some of their history in the last you know, 10 years, 20 years, it, they just don't seem willing to fight for what they believe as hard as Republicans are willing to fight for what they believe. And this is why when people are confused how this president could still have 88% of his Republican support still in place after everything, because they believe in a few things, they don't need their candidates to be perfect. Example, President Trump, they will say he is not perfect in any way, but he will get us justices, he'll get us judges, he will get lower our taxes. That's un ingrained in the way that they think, whereas Democrats want everyone to tick off every single box. And yeah. when we talk about how you persuade, that'll be something that we will uh, get to know. Uh, by the way, Mary C. Curtis is watching and she says, great to see you again. It's been a while. Give me some tips because she'll be our guest next Sunday on the show. So much going on in my beat, the intersection of politics, culture, and race. Mary and I worked together in the home section at the Times. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's right. And there she is. She'll be our guest next Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. This is a good chance for me to remind everyone, please share this video with Trish Hall with the world. Tag your friends and find them and share with them on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And next Sunday, we have Mary Curtis, award-winning journalist, trainer, speaker, former New York Times editor, Roll Call, NBC, Washington Post, The Root, NPR, and MSNBC. And please find me on Twitter, at Sri, and Srinet on Instagram and on Facebook so that you can easily know when our next shows are on. And thank you, Mary, for tuning in a week early so that you can uh, see how Trish is doing this so masterfully so that you can also do such a great job next week. So let's get back to the paper, shall we? And let's look at what is happening on the front page. Uh, you, you run multiple sections. What is the importance of the front, the cover? What, what is above the fold in everything you do? I mean, the, the importance of print has really evolved and actually declined in a lot of ways internally in an effort to make digital production faster and, and more attuned to what readers wanted. There was a need to focus less on less on print in some ways, at least internally in the way people thought about it. But most of the time I was at the Times, the you know reporters really wanted to be on page one, editors really wanted to get their stories on page one. So there were meetings every day where it was like, you know, gladiators like struggling, like I have this story and it does this, and I have this story and it does this. And so it was like a marketplace of ideas and in theory, the best stories won and also the best mix was meant to win. I mean, page one is supposed to give you a, a sense of variety, not, not all one kind of story. And that's important so that they have that mix. So let's look at this virus inundates Texas fed by abiding mistrust of government orders. And you will see, I think when we look back that Governor Abbott is one of the reasons why thousands of people got sick in this country. And look at that, masks, we're done with all that when in fact, Texas and other places didn't really do the masking that was required. Lessons of New York in Houston's ERs. Uh, on, over here, German force fears ninroads by neo-Nazis in an elite unit, stolen arms and SS songs. And that's something that people may not realize mm -hmm. how much Germany has done in terms of banning any kind of mention of uh, the or Nazi insignia, swastikas, all of that. America is much more lenient about these things. So to have this crop, crop up inside the German army will be a very scary situation. Uh, the show must go on from behind plexiglass. This is a story out uh, talking out of Richmond, Virginia and other places. Uh, I see that Broadway has been shuttered through the end of the year, but 
maybe other places the show is going on. Convention move gives GOP financial headache in two cities. And we saw that President Trump decided to move the convention out of North Carolina for the only reason that he wasn't he wouldn't be surrounded by as many people because they wanted social distancing. And he thinks he's punishing the state by moving out the convention, but he will be punishing the other state that he goes to as well. As virus rages and poll numbers slip, American carnage again. And that's what he has been saying. And he is really leaning into what he thinks is the way in which you have to think about the re-election. What is your what are your feelings about President Trump and candidate Trump persuader in chief now? I mean, it was a struggle in some ways writing this book and reconciling it with Trump. And my first version, I had a really wonderful editor at Norton. And my first version had a lot of Trump in it. And he's like, no, this this needs to be somewhat timeless. You can't be so focused on Trump. But Trump is a puzzle because when you do, when you study what's been written about persuasion, the essence of persuasion is to find um, common ground with another person, to feel empathy for another person, to understand them so that you can find a way to reach each other. And in the process of reaching each other, there's persuasion. Trump is the opposite of that, right? I mean, Trump is not about persuading those who don't agree with him. He's about keeping tight the people who do agree with him. And the last time that was enough to get him elected, it's not clear whether it will be this time because some may have defected. And the defections pose an interesting question about what's persuading them to back away from Trump. But he does not really change the way he functions. He's not trying to win over people. He's not trying to win over independents or Democrats. He's trying to just keep the people he has. That is true. And we'll talk more about your book in just a minute. What do you think about the New York Times capitalizing the B in black? I don't know. I don't know what I think because I think that I don't I don't know what it's supposed to signify to the reader. Does it signify that black is different than white? Does, what does it mean? I don't know. I I, I understand. I, I don't know. I've thought about it, but I can't say that it that I know the message that it's supposed to give to the reader. And this is an interesting article that I hope everyone will read. And here's how it starts by Nancy Coleman. The last time the New York Times made a sweeping call to capitalize how it referred to people of African ancestry was nearly a century ago. W.E. Du Bois uh, had started a letter writing campaign and asking publications, including the Times, to capitalize the N in Negro, a term that long since eradicated from the, uh, the Times pages. And so an interesting uh, call back to that era. And so I look forward to reading this as well, but it's following in the footsteps of the AP, the Washington Post and other places. And our executive producer is a big fan of the Yankees. So we'll look at this story here. On this day in history, 61,808 fans roar tribute to Lou Gehrig. This was the famous speech that he gave and uh, he said that this was this is the story. So Lou Gehrig, stricken with ALS, made his farewell speech at Yankee Stadium, so shaken with emotion, the time rep Times reported that at first it appeared that he was not able to talk at all. The report added that Mr. Gehrig expressed his appre appreciation with a rare display of that indomitable willpower that had carried him through 20, 2,130 consecutive games. With head bowed, Mr. Gehrig said he considered himself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. He died two years later at age 37. And I love this on this day in history section that they have they've put together. And we learned from your former colleague, Stuart Elliott, the legendary advertising columnist that, th that Tiffany has had the page three spot for a hundred years, uh, more than a hundred and now 103 years, because that was a couple of years ago that, uh, that uh, Stuart was our guest. Mm -hmm. Tracking an outbreak, the Times does this, as you know, where they uh, you know, make a kind of a mini section inside the front 
uh, in, in the front section here. By the way, feel free to drop in any commentary, but also any kind of jargon and things that uh, we may not know about how what things are called or as you, you taught us a word already, furniture in terms of columns that are regular, right? That's the definition of furniture. And uh, so please jump in if you have any insights here that you'd like to share. No, I think the Times has done a really good job of, of being flexible with the design of the A section so that now when there are big stories they want to focus on and, and collect them like that, they do it really well. There were times in the past where things were kind of scattered throughout the paper and I, that doesn't happen as much anymore. So I think that really helps readers. I mean, the, there's a guy named Tom Botkin who's been head of design and sort of the, the image the Times presents for a very long time. And he thinks the goal always is what will make this easiest for the reader. It's not what will make it easiest to produce. It's like what will make this appealing to the reader and logical and easy to follow. And that's his job. And he's always trying to find new and better ways to, to make it reader friendly. Thank you. And we should see if we can track him down to uh, explain some of this to us, because I know there'll be lots of interest. Trump's pick criticized a global internet fund. I've not, I've not even heard of this. Uh, things are so busy. I will want to uh, go back and read that story. And then look at this. This is unusual. This seems like a, a special report that's in, instead of being its own section, it's at least in my paper inside A1. And it's invisible outbreaks sprang up everywhere. The United States ignored the warning signs. We reconstructed how the pandemic spun out of control. And it's called It Started Small. Very interesting. Wow, look at this graphics, this graphic I mean, treatment here. You know, partly in an attempt to keep print readers, at times it's always been in this complicated position of wanting to get more digital readers and more print readers, and sometimes they have different needs. So it was, I don't know, four or five years ago, I can't remember exactly, um, there was a focus on how to create sections just for print readers. So print readers would feel like they were getting something special and that it wasn't just a compilation of what was on the web. So there's more special sections like that. There's the section for children. There's just a focus on giving print readers something extra, which I think has probably been really valuable. It's a nice thing. Thank you. And I see that Stefan Kaplan says, Tom Bodkin is a brilliant man. Stefan worked at the New York Times for 20 years as a photo editor. Chilling word, words for renters, be out by tomorrow. Eviction bans are little help to many, including those whose bigger fear is deportation. And we just were talking about shelter being so important. And more stories, two brothers, one lifted by DACA, one not. A city gives multiple right, family rights to multiple partner unions. So that's big news, Ellen Barry story. And uh, just when you started in, in 1986, it was all print, uh, all black and white at the New York Times, and then they introduced color. It's interesting yeah. that the journalists um, rebel now and being so outspoken because um, in a lot of ways, I used to think journalists were a very conservative group of people, at least as regarded their own industry, because when I started at the Times, it was black and white. And then I remember when it was gonna go color and a lot of people just like were appalled that the New York Times was gonna lose its seriousness. It was gonna lose its very nature. And how could it possibly be in color? Color was something people associated with USA Today, which was relatively new then. So it's funny, It's it's it, you may think that the outside world should change, but I think journalists have a hard time sometimes with the changes to their actual work product. And color was deeply resistant. So when I went to the Times as a food reporter, our pictures of food were in black and white, which was not always great. And so we now see, of course, so much use of color in the paper. Uh, this is the obit section. I'm obsessed with obits. I'd love to hear your take on them. Let's see, Rudolfo Anaya, 82, a father of Chicano literature, dies. And here, Margaret Morton, a photographer at home with the homeless, dies at 71. Two obits highlighted here. And the New York Times has made it an effort to try and highlight 
people who don't usually get covered in the obituaries? I mean, I, I probably shouldn't admit this because it's a weird preoccupation with grim news, but I always read the pandemic stories first and then I read obituaries. I've always liked obituaries because they're like small biographies. They don't take the kind of time commitment, obviously, that reading the biography does. But when they're well done, I think some of the over the years, the best writers at the Times have done obits. Um, and right now, because they're doing obituaries of a bigger range of people to show the um, consequences of the pandemic, they've had some people who work in other departments who are particularly good at profiles doing obituaries. So one is Penelope Green, who's a reporter in the style department, and she writes beautiful profiles. And so now I'm really looking for the um, obituaries that she does. And so they're sad, but they're also illuminating. And we see Bill Mitchell says, even in the last year or so, there appears much more dramatic use of inside pages in the A section. And we also see that Janine was in a print newsroom before ads hit the front page, which was also a big moment. You remember when that happened? I think it was a Citibank ad on the front page of the New York Times, and people lost their minds. They did. When that happened. I mean, Let's I, go to this. Please. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I mean, there, I guess the reason I shouldn't say journalists are conservative about their own work product, but sometimes I don't think they are so much anymore. But I used to feel like they were sort of naive that they, the business reporters, understood the business, but a lot of people who weren't in that, didn't have that perspective on the world, they really, it's a mission for most journalists. And I admire that mission, but it's also a business. And and at the point where the Times decided to take ads on page one, it, it was not clear that the New York Times was gonna survive. Newspapers have been under enormous pressure and it worked out and now people will talk about it as if it was inevitable. And of course the Times was always going to be this like big, but that wasn't the way it felt. I mean, there were times when I was working there and we were laying people off and we were shrinking sections and getting rid of sections and taking any ad we could get that wasn't really despicable. It did not at all feel inevitable that the Times would survive. And sometimes it's just like, reporters would be so angry about concessions that they saw things they saw as concessions to the business side. And I admit that I didn't see them. I wanted the times to live. So they seemed necessary to me, but you know, maybe I'm just a sellout. Hard to say. No, you're not a sellout. I believe one of the original sins, I don't know why I'm saying the word original sin so many times today, but one of the original sins of journalism was not the division between business and editorial. That was the, one of the great things but the feeling that you shouldn't know anything about the business side, that was the problem. It's okay to have a fence, but right. we need to know what's happening on the other side. No other worker in America was as detached from the business side on purpose. And if you learned by accident something about the business side, you know, it was bad for motherhood and apple pie. And, and so what happens is that every other worker knows his or her place in the, in the production and what that means and where money comes from. And they were able to, in some cases at least, have some control over it. But journalists had no opportunity for that. And as a result, we're seeing what happened. So that's one of the reasons why journalism is in the state it's in. A lot of people, including me, thought that it's really bad for folks to understand. Only when I started becoming a print journalist, that I mean, a business journalist, did I start paying attention to the business side and said, wait a minute, journalism is a business too. And we have no God-given right to always be around. And we have to reinvent and invent and try new things and experiment. And we have to do that. Otherwise, this great mission that we have will not succeed. I, I agree. I had um, much more experience with the business side at the Times than most editors because it annoyed me tremendously. But a lot of people saw the feature sections as something that was created just to like please the business side. I, you know the hope was they would get advertising and they did get advertising, but they were also invented to please readers at any rate because of, because the feature sections were seen that way. I had more access to the business side and, and more opportunities to understand it. But really after, after I was the op-ed editor for two years, I was in the newsroom um, 
as sort of the bridge between the business side and the news side. And Dean Becker wanted me to try to find projects that would help the advertising sites sell sponsorships and and do new projects that we might get funding against. And um, one reason he wanted me to do that job was he thought that I had enough credibility that people wouldn't think that I would let shoddy journalism go out just to make money. But it's it's really hard to be on the business side in, in news media because most of the newsroom, as you said, they don't know what they do or what it's like. I really admire those people. It's really rough. It's a very rough business. And therefore, journalists were not ready when the troubles came because they didn't realize that you know, being in a land of 25% profit margins forever was not a God-given right. And they didn't know that. Uh, by the way, Pavan Dingra is watching. Nice to hear the history of the times. He says, Pavan was our guest last weekend, the author of Hyper Education. And he's going to be a guest on my daily program, I hope, this Thursday. And uh, great to see all our guests kind of converging and connecting here. And, uh, and to everyone who's watching, let me just say, Please share this right now with your friends and family on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. We have about another 30 minutes with Trish Hall, the uh, former op-ed editor of the New York Times, op-ed page editor of the New York Times. And we're very grateful to her for being here with us. And please share so that more people can watch this. And we have been doing this for five years now, and I have learned so much doing this. And I know you have as well. We have thousands of people who watch every single week. And it's one of the highlights of my week to be able to do this with our amazing team of Neil Parikh, uh, Steve Taylor, Paula Kiger, Julia Weeks, Carla Baranakis, who was a colleague of Trish's. She was the New York Times copy chief, national copy chief. And uh, let's here's a photo of all of these people. And just great to have a team that's able to bring in a, a great production every single week that the way they've been doing it makes such a difference and we love everybody's support of what we do by your watching by your sharing by hitting uh up your friends who uh like the news and like facts that's why we do this every single week for uh for all of these years so we appreciate your time but another thing you can do is if you know someone who'd like to sponsor this please let us know we have very flexible uh, and uh and uh and and hard-hitting opportunities for you to uh, sponsor us and get your message out to people, not just on this show, but our multiple shows, including the every single day we do the daily global COVID-19 show, which is a spinoff of this. Uh, we have She's On Call, a show uh, uh, by female uh, surgeons about the medical situation in this country. So these are all ways that we can work together and we have to constantly innovate and try to do things that bring people together around the world. If we want to persuade people about the importance of facts and information, and Trish is going to talk about her book uh, about how you persuade when in the written form in just a few minutes. So thank you all for watching. Please share this right now with your friends and family. Uh, and a big shout out to all our regular viewers, especially, especially those who have been with us for so many years and those who are able to just hit share or just tag a few friends and just that act of tagging one friend will get this out to a much wider audience. Let's look at some of the other comments here. Paula has been giving you all the social media information for each of our uh, staff folks, and uh, it's a great way for you to connect with them. And uh, Sujana is, uh, has a comment here. Medicine for a long time had that huge firewall. It was a lonely time to be on uh, the surface, but when we were forced to understand that we are in a business and unless we stay in a business, we can't deliver health care. I think we docs were able to advocate for patients and better health systems. And Sujana is co-host of the She's On Call show. It's coming up at 11 a.m. Eastern time at She's On Call on Facebook and at She's On Call on Twitter. And just great to see all the comments coming in. So keep telling us how your Sunday is going. What are you learning from this show? And also, if you have a favorite op-ed, because we're going to ask Trish in a few minutes, what was her favorite op-ed that she edited or helped supervise at some point? Uh, and there's Mark's question about that. And uh, we'll ask her to talk about it before we go to her book and also take a dive into the Sunday review section. I do want to show the sports section here in front of us. 
It's a much narrowed down sports section. And John Branch, who is a terrific writer, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, has this column here that says, as sports return, it's time to kneel and be counted. Athletes who stand for the national anthem have to explain themselves. And this is another example, Trish, of how Donald Trump framed it as being against the country. All this guy was doing, Colin Kaepernick, was just kneeling in the most uh, respectful manner possible. And it got framed and that immediately put the progressives on their back foot, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, it's hard. I mean, Trump is very smart about framing. And for those of you who missed it, we talked about that earlier, the power of framing that Trish talked about, words like global warming and words like defund the police. And now let's get into the Sunday Review and then we'll talk about your book. Uh, what does the Sunday Review mean to you? You uh, helped create it. It grew out of other sections, of course, but talk about that, please. Well, the original idea of the Sunday Review, it, it replaced the Week in Review, which I think was a much loved section, but it had, and it had some great editors, but it also had some big challenges. They were trying to be very timely, so they would have to sort of make all their decisions and do a lot of their writing late Friday night. And it felt like people wanted more analysis, they wanted more opinion. So it was a cooperative venture between the newsroom and opinion. And it was going to be you know, mostly opinion, but some newsroom analysis pieces, which it still is. It's probably shifted more toward being opinion as, as the years have gone by. But um, what I liked about Sunday Review was the chance to run both serious, pieces, um, long pieces by columnists, and unexpected lifestyle social science pieces that you might not, you wouldn't find on the daily op-ed page. They weren't written in the form of, a, of an 800 word argument. They were, they were more varied. And I liked, I liked that variety. I liked trying to surprise people. We had a great photo editor who's still there named Jeffrey Scales. Who would who invented this column called Exposures, and um, it, it was a chance for people to do something different than what they had been doing on the op-ed page. By the way, my mom's watching in Kerala. Have you been to India? I have not. All right, so you you've got to go. My mom yeah. says hello, and Debbie says year five of three live. Keep it up. Thank you, Debbie. You've been a friend and fan for a long time. And Kathleen Brill says. This is my favorite Facebook Live and a great guest today. So thank you. We are here every Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern, and then 9 p.m. on Sunday nights, uh, and most nights, 9 p.m. Eastern with our daily COVID show, otherwise at noon on Eastern uh, uh, on, on other days uh, when we're doing our show. So let's talk about the series. I guess it's called The Economy We Need. And uh, one of my favorite journalists, Kevin Delaney, who founded Quartz is now working with the op-ed section and he is the series editor of the America We Need. And uh, this is the jobs we need. And then inside we have different uh, sections here. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at any of these. Are you willing to give up your privilege? Uncomfortable questions for Darren Walker. Darren's mm -hmm. a friend and the president of the Ford Foundation. So he is the subject of uncomfortable questions. Two, same Job, Two Generations uh, by Laurie Kelly. And uh, health, health Insurance is Broken, uh, Declaring Healthcare Independence by Janine Interlandy. And Janine's a terrific writer, former student at mine when I was at Columbia Journalism School. How much, Ameri how much money Americans actually make, equitable pay or not? And uh, this is a look at the different rates and prices of, 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 or the price tags of salaries. Bosses weren't always so sh selfish, sharing the wealth. Robert Reich is the writer here. He is the former uh, uh, treasury secretary and a terrific writer himself. Banks should face history and cancel black debt now. Rethinking the rescue of ailing companies by Tim Wu. Uh, who is a, a, a great writer and a professor, a law professor at Columbia, The Invisible Men Problem by David Leonhardt. The well, black-white wage gap is as big as it was in 1950. The future of work looks like this. Essential labor, that's one of the words that you used about mm -hmm. essential. Making it work, photographs and text by Leah Nash. 
and uh, America needs repairs, here's where to start, an agenda for change by the editorial board. So this is the editorial board uh, writing in what I used to call unsigned editorials. Was that the insider term also, or is it something else? I think it was implicit that if it was an editorial, it was unsigned. And then when they started to try to get the more personal voices of the editorial writers out, they would call them editorial notebook or give them some kind of a name. But an editorial was by definition sort of the institutional opinion without a signature from an individual. I mean, that's an interesting Sunday review section because it's not typical. It's a special section devoted to a particular issue and looking at it from a lot of different perspectives. Op-ed has changed a great deal since I was there. It's now um, the editorial board is different now. There's They're encouraging editorial board members to write sign pieces. There are fewer editorials. They're hoping, I think, that the ones they run will have more impact um, because there are fewer of them. And editorial and op-ed, um, as much as there was always a wall between the newsroom and opinion, there was actually kind of a wall between op-ed and, and um, the editorial board and the editorials so that the, the concept of op-ed, when it was started in the 70s, the idea was it wasn't just literally opposite the editorial page in the paper. It was supposed to have opinions that were different from the editorial board's opinions. So most of us who have been op-ed editors have taken that to heart and taken it pretty literally so that my goal was to get things more to the left and more to the right but not that centrist liberal point of view that the Times espouses because what is the point really of duplicating that in op-ed when the editorial board is saying that? But um, I think that's still true, but what's changed is that opinion and op-ed have merged more and there are editors who oversee aspects of both parts of the operation. So they're no longer separate in the same way and um, in some, in some cases, that's really advantageous with a special section like this. They've sort of merged forces from both parts of that opinion department. Thank you, Trisha. I just pulled up last week's print issue of Sunday Review. So because it's more traditional, if you will, oh. so that people could understand. And op-ed's not a word that they know in most other parts of the world until the time started using it and it became uh, something that was used on the Internet. So just explain that this was the editorial, the unsigned editorials, the editorial board's vision, and this was the op-ed. And so one of the things that you said that might struck some, strike some people as unusual is that you said that the Times editorial board at least all, used to aim for centrist views or well, because it, now people I, consider it much more progressive than that, right? I mean, I think people look at the New York Times editorials as sort of it's 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 a liberal newspaper, right? It wasn't always. I mean, randomly enough, because I obviously wasn't working at the New York Times then. When I was in college, I wrote a long paper on studying the New York Times editorials during the suffrage movement, and they were very anti-woman. And they were they even when they weren't anti-suffrage, they were very um, condescending. And it was it was fascinating to look at the way editorials evolved over the years, but you know, that was the mainstream view. I think that generally the New York Times editorial positions have been sort of mainstream liberal, whatever that means to people at that moment in history. And so op-ed needs to be something different. And that's, you know, that's, there were a lot of people who didn't like things that I ran when I was there because they, disagreed with those opinions or they thought they were bad people writing them. But if you believe in presenting um, diverse ideas, then you just have to live with that. So you know that's going to bring us to the Tom Cotton edit op-ed <laughs> publication. Pawan, our guest who was here last week, says, can Ms. Hall weigh in on the op-ed publication and the, I guess the brouhaha around it? I mean, it, it's it's I thought it was, um, I really admired Jim Dow, who was the op-ed editor who ran that, and I didn't talk to him about it. I'm sure he had good reasons for running it. Personally, and this really, you know, we all bring our personal history to everything. And I first became a journalist covering 
riots at Berkeley in the late 60s and early 70s because I was a student there and I spent all my time working on the college paper. So the way America was sort of burning up in the 60s, I could even understand someone making an argument then that you might need the military. I didn't really understand why, but it didn't feel like there was so much danger going on in America's cities that you needed the military. So I might not have been interested in that op-ed because I wasn't getting the feeling that it was that kind of a crisis. But Jim is a really great editor, and I'm sure he had reasons for thinking it was an important point of view. And I, I understand that people were annoyed at the editorial or angry at the editorial for two reasons. Some is just what it said, and some was the idea that the Times would, would give a voice to someone that they thought was despicable. And... I think it's really important for the Times to give voices, to give platforms to people that are unpopular. So that part of it, I disagree with. The aspect of whether that was a good op-ed, that's a different thing, but it's really, what I found most upsetting about everything that happened with that is that so many people in the newsroom seem to feel that they they should have kind of a say or have an opinion on what was happening in opinion. And I think that's risky. I think it's really important to keep news and opinion separate and to not have the reporters feel that the opinions reflect on them. I mean, I was a reporter and editor at the Wall Street Journal, and most of us in the newsroom thought their editorials were ridiculous, okay? I mean, we, reporters tend to be more liberal. We weren't big fans of the editorial page, but it was the editorial page, it was them, it was the other. And I do think it's a little risky to have that otherness clearly breaking down. And a lot of that has to do with the internet, doesn't it? Because now you see the stories all mixed together in different ways, whereas in the in the age of, of newspapers or print newspapers alone, you would see that, okay, this is, in its lane, so to speak, and you would see, okay, this is the editorial page over here, and this is the op-ed page, all of those things, all those those divisions have broken down, and you're absolutely right, the Wall Street Journal is the biggest example of where the newspaper reporting side, the news folks, come completely, are most of them anywhere, disdainful, and uh, in some ways ashamed of what happens on the editorial page, but they, they know that there's a difference. And now that difference is is kind of, that line is disappearing. And again, even though I've shown you this, I now learned that even though this is the op-ed section and more traditional, you were commissioning the pieces of the non-columnists, right? The non-columnists, non-editorial. So there, were, there are three kinds of editorials in the Times, right? There's the unsigned editorial board ones. There are the columnists such as Nick Kristoff and Ross Douthat and Maureen Dowd. And then there are the submissions from uh, from experts and random people. Any day they get hundreds and hundreds. Uh, one of the things I've learned in this crisis is that some of my friends who are uh, opinion editors at various publications is that they're turning away Nobel laureates and, and CEOs and others because suddenly everyone's decided they wanted to be an opinion writer, isn't it, Trish? I mean, I think people, have for a while seen op-ed pages as a really good way to get out whatever message they have, whether they've just written a book or whether they're just been elected to Congress. And so there is a lot of competition for that space. And I did find that kind of humbling and almost embarrassing to be in this position to turn away people who were very smart and often wrote good pieces, but there wasn't enough. We couldn't handle more than a certain number of pieces even, you know, maybe there were two or three in print and maybe there were some online, but there's a limit to how many you can do. So you're always looking for what feels like the most urgent thing to say at that moment. There's this sort of sense of a national conversation, what people are reading, what people are thinking. And you're always trying to help people think of a different way of looking at something by using history, by just a different political slant. You're just trying to move that conversation forward and 
give people information that they might not have just from reading the news pages. Here is Lisa saying, good point. The internet has blurred it. Some of my students who are digital readers weren't aware of such divisions in the publication. And so this is where journalists, I think, have to do a better job of explaining what we do. And that's why we love it when uh, current and former New York Times editors and staffers are able to come on our show. Let's look at some of the other comments. Kitty says, Walter Cronkite was the best, just straight news, no opinion. But Kitty, wasn't it the moment where we saw that, uh, that President Johnson said that he had lost the country when he lost Walter Cronkite? So even Uncle Walter was occasionally picking, even in the selection of stories, there is an opinion that is expressed or a bias that comes through. But we must talk about your book. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, let's talk about the book. Tell us how you decided to write it. And did you, is it like leaving the CIA? Are you, do you need to get permission to uh, write a book like that about the inside look at the Times? You do. I mean, I had, um, I didn't have in tons of inside stuff. The book is sort of a combination of researching the psychology of persuasion, some kind of basic writing, tip, um, some of my personal history. But there are stories from the Times, and I did have to have it read by Times lawyers. I never would say something negative about the Times. I don't think they were afraid of that, that would be that kind of expose. But I was relying on private emails. I was relying on emails between me and my boss, Andy Rosenthal, and with various writers. So I went back to every writer whose email I was quoting in any way. I, I went back to people to get permission because I do think emails are privileged and private, and I don't think people should publish them without asking. So, and technically, of course, the Times owned all of my emails, so they did read it and and they approved it. I didn't have any problems getting it approved, but it, it made sense that they would want to see it, and they did. Carla says, I just finished reading Trisha's book oh, right now. I can't hear you. Uh, one second. Uh, can you hear me now? No? You can't hear me? Yes. You can. Okay. I just finished reading Trisha's book, Writing to Persuade, says Carla. Anyone who wants to write op-ed should read this book. In addition, it gives a great look inside the op-ed department and some fascinating details about Trisha's life. Ooh, uh, let's hear one of those fascinating details of Trisha's life. Um, I have not had a fascinating life, but I think one thing that made me different from a lot of people at the New York Times was that I grew up in a rural area in northeastern Pennsylvania, and um, I was not a sophisticated child. Um, I did not spend my time around intellectuals like a lot of people I met at the Times. And so I think when people talk about diversity, gender diversity, racial diversity, it's all really important, but so is geographic diversity. I think that you're shaped where, by where you grew up. And although I've lived in New York for a very long time, I'm not a New Yorker. And I think that that really had a big influence on what I thought was interesting, which sort of gets back to what you said about uh, objectivity and you know, we all bring ourselves to every story. And because you bring your history and your whole self to every story you write or every story you commission, that's really why you need a lot of different kinds of people. You need religious people, you need atheists, you need you need everything, or you're not gonna get a very full picture. And your Twitter handle is Trish P. Hall, the letter P, and uh, also your, your website is Trish Hall Books, right, dot com. And uh, we encourage everybody to, uh, to take a look at, uh, at the book and please buy it and support uh, great authors like uh, Trish. Let's look at some of the comments coming in. Pavan, who was our uh, guest last week, he says, uh, thanks for your insights into the cotton op-ed. By the way, my favorite op-ed in the New York Times was mine, meaning his from last year. And he looked forward to reading your book. And Paula has put in a link. It was about the, uh, it, it had a great title. It said, the spelling bee is broken, don't fix it. And it was about the spelling bee. And Pavan's also in the new Netflix documentary about the spelling bee that everyone can find uh, on Netflix. Uh, let's look at some of the uh, questions that are coming in. 
Um, and comments, Deb, Debbie says, oh, sorry, Debbie says, uh, choice of first page articles, New York Times progressive slant objective. What do you what do you think about the first page articles? Do you consider them progressive or uh, objective in the news versus the opinion debate? I don't think they're, that they're progressive or objective. I think that every decision the journalist makes is based on what that person thinks is important. And Dean Beck Hay, when he's deciding or his team of editors are deciding what should be on page one, that's what they think readers should know. And some days that may look like it's a progressive slant, depending on what the news is. And to some left-wing readers, the Times is always going to seem like a wishy-washy on the one hand. On the other hand, publication of the Times consistently gets criticized from every direction. But I think that it's not guided by a political philosophy as much as a philosophy of what's important. And that's uh, that's complicated and that changes from era to era. Thank you. I have to ask about the uh, photograph behind you. Oh. <laughs> um, that's a painting of a photograph of my husband and our dog. Um, he spent a great deal of time with the dog when the dog was young in the dog run in Washington Square Park, and there was an artist there who did that. And, um, you know, it sounds crazy. I've met a lot of wonderful people through my daughter and her schools and through my work, but I've also met a lot of people at the dog run, which is a it brings together more different kinds of people in New York than any other setting I've experienced there. Thank you. And Ron Thomas, our uh, our great friend, former guest and sponsor of the show who's watching in Dubai says he just bought your book on Audible. So there you go. People can buy the book online or buy the audio version that Carla linked to as well. And Mary Curtis, who is our guest next week, says, I agree with Trish on diversity. I grew up in West Baltimore, a place that so many people have preconceived notions about. See you next week, she says. Uh, we also do want to make sure we look at the New York Times Magazine and Isabel Wilkerson, the amazing writer, has the cover magazine. So one of the things we do, Trish, is we show folks the video that's put together by the Times Magazine behind the cover. So we're going to watch that and then we'd love your take on it as well. I'm, I've not read this yet, but I look forward to reading or listening to behind the cover. So let's do that right now. And uh, the, while that's being set up, I'll just say that the, uh, the cover story here, oh, here, here it comes now. From the New York Times Magazine, this is Behind the Cover. Our cover story this week is an essay by Isabel Wilkerson that is adapted from her forthcoming book about the enduring racial caste system in America. We wanted to work with an artist that would bring their own voice to the cover, so we reached out to conceptual artist Adam Pendleton. His work really strives to find a way to talk about the future while talking about the past. He works with existing imagery, but then he brings his own layer of commentary to it by adding text and even markings that make it feel handled. We had asked him to consider using a portion of a famous Frederick Douglass speech that's known as the What to the American Slave is the Fourth of July speech. When you combine text and image, that mashup creates a new layer of meaning that speaks to this particular moment. And what that text is really about is the giant lapse between the ideals and, and its reality. Most weeks we try to create a cover that has an immediate read. But, but in this instance, I think it's something that you have to sit with and notice details. It's about emotion. In the end, what we have is not only a major piece of writing by Isabel Wilkerson, but also a major work of art by Adam Pendleton, and the two of them together working to convey a really powerful message about America on the 4th of July. You have probably not had a chance to read this yet, but I look, I'm certainly looking forward to reading it. Also in the Times Magazine this week is a story about about Sri Lanka and about the um, the wealthy kids who were part of a bombing plot in 
uh, in Colombo, and that's a that's a picture of the Cinnamon Grand Hotel. The bombing took place last uh, Easter 2019. On Easter 2018, my family and I were in that hotel to have a meal, and uh, so a year uh, exactly a year later, we uh, saw that bombing take uh, take take place. And one of these rich sons of the wealthy Muslim spice trader who helped carry out that bombing went to lunch at that. Uh, at that very fancy uh, restaurant in the Cinnamon Grand Hotel. And we had the priest who uh, was on duty uh, and giving a sermon at a church that was blown up that same day in the multiple attacks that took place in Sri Lanka that same day was on our daily COVID show talking about what's life like in Sri Lanka today. I want to ask you, Trish, what is it like in trying to get international op-eds into the New York Times how easy was that? And what kind of resistance was there any to, to that? And what advice do you have? I We want to really end on that point. Uh, what kind of advice can you give to people who want to be able to write for the New York Times op-ed page? So first, the international question, and then if you can give us just a couple of highlights, because we want everybody sure. to buy your book instead, but certainly a couple of highlights would be most welcome. Um when I was there, we expanded the international coverage. We had more international editors, more regular um, contributors, because the Times itself was becoming more global, and so did opinion. I think the same, so there's a great demand for international op-eds, but the same um, concepts apply to the international ones as apply to the domestic ones. You always need to be saying something surprising. If you're just kind of wrapping up what everyone knows, or you're just doing an analysis without an opinion, it probably won't work. The best op-eds, to me, the best op-eds tell some kind of story. They stick with you in some way, you can't shake it. Like the black woman who wrote a piece, I think it was last week, about how her body um, was a representation of US history, that her ancestry um, in this country started with the rape of a, a white man raped a black woman. It was incredibly vivid. So the best op-eds have that kind of vivid story and that people can relate to. And they um, are making an argument and they don't use jargon and they don't, um, they're not really wordy. Those are all incredibly difficult things to accomplish. But the central thing is to look at something from a point of view or in a way or in a fashion that's different from what people have read before. So that an editor goes, wow, this is amazing. I want to run this. Thank you. Ron says the New York Times read along is a weekly master class. Each week, the topics are so interesting and enlightening. We'd like to show some of the blurbs uh, from folks who liked your book. So let's show those on the screen and uh, I'll just read them out here. And uh, people loved your book, and here is what Booklist said, woven together throughout our fascinating anecdotes from Hall's career, stories of chasing the truth, interrogating her own opinions, and encouraging others to do the same. And another one, here, uh, here it comes, uh, Mark Danner, endowed chair in journalism and English at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. Whether your goal is to learn to write effective opinion pieces or to understand what an editor at the New York Times does, or simply follow the gripping story of an intrepid woman who rose to a powerful news executive, who rose to be a powerful news executive at a pivotal moment in journalistic history. It's a fascinating, essential book. And one more, uh, Kirkus Review says, a lucid book about building bridges through communication along with some interesting behind the scenes background at the New York Times. So that's a nice roundup of the blurbs uh, there. And I was struck by your saying that when you were a student, you did some research about the New York Times editorials about the suffragist movement. And I presume you never expected to one day be at the New York Times, let alone running part of that section. No, I certainly didn't. I mean, the because of the time I came of age in journalism, um, what we called the straight press, which is funny now that all these words have different meanings, but it was like, you know, who would want to work for those corporate places? Well, anyway, things change. 
They, they, they certainly do. And so let's look at a few more comments and then we'll let you go and get back to your Sunday. What is your Sunday, by the way, today? Um, I really like to weed. I, I, I have a house on Long Island and a big garden and I weed a lot and then I listen to podcasts and um, I don't know. I'll read. Did you I'm say reading. You like to read, um, or did you say you about, like to read, or you like to weed, or both? I, I weed and I read. So I weed, and I'm reading a book called *A Month in the Country*, which is about. Um, it's set after World War One in England, and um, basically, I would say I read and I weed, and I don't. I don't know that I do a lot else. I I, I go for long walks, so I'm sure this day will be like other days. Great. Lisa says looking forward to reading it. Others have said they're going to get it for their audible for their long ride home. Chaitna says it was a wonderful read along. Thank you, Sri, for bringing Krish Hall to the show. And thank you for watching. And Chaitna is a doctor and a frontline worker in, in uh, the New York City area. And Debbie says, what was it like working for Abe Rosenthal? I was actually hired right after he retired. I worked for his son, Andy Rosenthal, was the opinion page editor. He was my boss when I was the op-ed editor. And I loved Andy. He was a fabulous boss, but I didn't know Abe. I got to know Abe a little bit. I uh, was uh, uh, very honored to get to know him through our South Asian Journalists Association. And I got to meet him before I met Andy. And he was a foreign correspondent in India back in the day. And he always ha was very interested in mm -hmm. Uh, news about India and the subcontinent. And so that's how we got to know each other. And there's Dana saying she's getting the audible for the long ride home. So before we before we uh, let you go, uh, any final thoughts as you are, if you were uh, still running the op-ed section, what would you be looking for in terms of the next pivotal months about the pandemic and about the financial situation? the racial situation and the election that's coming up. This is, I can't think of a more important stretch of time uh, in which the, the work that your colleagues do is going to have an impact. Yeah, at times like this, I tend to find the news so fascinating and so strong that, you know, opinion is, it's difficult to beat the news. The, the news is so crazy, but, it's always, I think, finding up as at a time like this, what, what I would be doing if I were still there, is that constant struggle to think, okay, we know the biggest story today is what's what's going on in Houston and how they're having a sort of New York experience and thinking what comes next. I mean, I've been in arguments with people. I'm surprised how many people are critical and judgmental. People in small towns who are not really believing in the pandemic or in rural areas and it hasn't been there yet. So I can understand why they haven't taken it as seriously as, as they might. So I think it's important to have pieces that show experiences from very different parts of the country because that is the challenge with this pandemic, aside from the political challenges and the way Trump has handled the CDC, that just the challenges, there's so many different parts to this country and, um, who is suffering and who isn't. And then obviously the big issue is economic. When the when the unemployment insurance ends, it's kind of terrifying to think about what happens to all of these people because we don't have the kind of protections for people that most countries in Europe have. Well, thank you so much for giving us so much to think about. And we've learned so much. Your insights have been fabulous. We're very grateful to you for your time. So we'll let you go as we uh, do some housekeeping here and point out to what's happening in the days ahead. So thank you very much, folks. Our guest has been Trish Hall. And please follow her, Trish P. Hall on Twitter, at Trish P. Hall and TrishHallBooks.com. And if you do get a chance to read her book, please let her know on Twitter and on uh, other social media. Thank you very much, Trish. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Let's now bring Neil back so that we can uh, do our goodbyes. Uh, this was a terrific show, Neil. Uh, we're so grateful to Carla Barnakis for bringing us Trish and the uh, and all the insights that we got from her. So we have some 
uh, thank yous to uh, hand out. A absolutely. Uh, we want to uh, certainly remind people about next week's guest. Uh, I was thrilled that uh, Mary Curtis was actually watching uh, uh, this week and, and commenting with Mary. We're looking forward to uh, next week's uh, show with you. Uh, so folks know uh, Mary is an award-winning journalist, as you can see. Um, and uh, a little bit more about her background. Uh, she's a columnist at Roll Call um, and has contrib contributed to, as we see, NBC, The Washington Post, the She, The People blog, uh, The Root, NPR, Women's Media Center, and uh, MSNBC, and talks politics on WCCB TV in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, so our friend Mark Lee, I'm sure, would be uh, interested uh, with the North Carolina connection. Um, Mary was a uh, national correspondent for AOL's Politics Daily and covered the 2008 and 2012 presidential campaigns and events such as the first National Tea Party Conference in Nashville. Her coverage specialty is the intersection of politics, culture, and race. Uh, so that is certainly going to be a fascinating discussion for us next week and uh, looking forward to that. Again, uh, thank you to Carla Varanakis for both the uh, uh, connecting us with Trish Hall and with Mary Curtis and several other guests that we have scheduled over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, we do uh, would like to recognize our sponsors again uh, before we close uh, this week's show. Uh, Shri, again, your um, uh, class with Muckrack uh, has 4,000 people that have signed up for it, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about that, that class? Sure, please, everyone who is interested in either brushing up their social media or learning from scratch. It's called Fundamentals of Social Media, free certification, and you get a certificate at the end of it, mrac.co slash social. And it says journalists and PR pros, but look at that third word, everyone. I have learned so much putting this together with Stefan Kaplan, Linda Bernstein, Tristy Heber, and our friend Mike Schneider and the entire team at Muckrack Academy. So please check us out. Absolutely. And we'd also like to recognize Magic Bus uh, USA. Magic Bus imagines a world where children break out of poverty and lead fulfilling, rewarding lives, contributing to their community and to the world around them. As you can see, uh, these stats are in India. Seven out of 10 adolescents do not have a higher secondary qualification. Six out of 10 youth do not have the soft skills necessary for employment. And three out of 10 girls are married before they reach the age of 18. Uh, thank you to Magic Bus for your support of the New York Times Read Along. And uh, in addition to Muckrack and Magic Bus USA, we'd also like to thank uh, Strategy Focus Group. And Ron Thomas, of course, is watching from Dubai. Um, Strategy Focus Group is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. Thank you to Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider from Muckrack, Pradnia Haldapur from Magic Bus USA, and Ron Thomas from Strategy Focus Group for your support. And uh, of course, what we'd like to do is to remind people if they'd like to learn more about our sponsors, please follow uh, these links to their websites, uh, readalong.link slash muckrack, readalong.link slash Magic Bus USA or readalong.link slash strategy focus group to learn more. And our producers will be sharing those links in the uh, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn uh, feeds. And again, as a reminder, it takes a whole team to put this show together. I uh, want to thank again, Paula Kiger uh, at Big Green Pen, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks, don't forget the L, and Carla Baranakis uh, at Kabara, C-A-B-A-R-A. -A -A. Srinivasan, of course, is the host, and my name is Neil Parekh. I'm the executive producer and guest host of the of Shri's Sunday New York Times read-along. Uh, thank you for joining us this week. It's been a great show. We've had some great uh, comments. Um, I just want to make sure that we uh, get to some of the comments that have come in, Shri, before we close, uh, because I think that, again, we it's it's all about having a, a great guest and a great conversation. Uh, Jonathan Borstein uh, telling us that it was a persuasive program. Uh, that was, I think, the whole point of 
the book. So, um, you know, live streaming to persuade, I guess, would be the next uh, iteration of that. Yeah, Lisa, Trish, can, Trish can talk to us about we can build a show for her just on that. Lisa, exactly. says, thank you. Let's uh, cycle through some of these. Janine says, thank you. And we see Debbie says, thank you, Trish, an early female editor. And uh, who else is here? We've got so many folks watching. I, I also want to uh, do two things. I want to tell people about two more shows that are coming up today that we want them to watch. But before that, I have a special surprise uh, announcement. Even Neil doesn't know I was going to do this, is we want to wish a very happy birthday to our dear friend, Sunny Slaughter. She is uh, a guest who's been on our show multiple times. It's her birthday today. And here she is <clears throat> on our uh, card of previous guests. Uh, you can see her on the extreme right there. She was a guest on our 1619 project and also on our show with Joe Stiglitz, Nobel laureate a couple of weeks ago with Harlan Coben, Stacey Stewart, president and CEO of March of Dimes, Amy Vership, the New York Times travel editor, and Tom Jolly, who's a print editor of the, of the New York Times, who also made uh, multiple uh, appearances on this show. We're very, very grateful to them. So let's tell folks about two shows that are coming up. And with that, we'll also say goodbye. Tonight, we have my positivity show, which takes place uh, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And we have an unusual combination, our first couple on the show, the Crybix. And Arthi Krybik is running for Congress in Tuesday's New Jersey primary election. And she's running against the Democrat who's voted the most often with Donald Trump, 76% of the time. And her husband will be joining us, Dr. Thomas Krybik, who's a neurologist. So we'll talk a little bit about healthcare. We'll talk about what it's like to be a candidate for office in the middle of all this. And there's an asterisk next to positivity because we believe it's important to be positive even in the middle of the world falling apart as it has been for so many months now. And with that, let's also show an ad for our new show, She's On Call. Hi, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon in New York City and New Jersey. And I'm Dr. Marina Kurian. I'm a general surgeon in New York City area. Sorry, the ad was uh, having trouble, but uh, just know that you can see it at Cheese on Call on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitter at Cheese on Call, 11 a.m. Eastern time every Sunday. So please tune in for that. And a big thanks to uh, my co-executive producers on that show, Dr. Marina Korean and Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. And Chitachi, who was a guest last night, uh, was... Uh, here she was a guest on this show and as also a guest last night we talked about what America means to me We had videos come in from all over the world and we had people telling us what America meant to them And we had great uh, a great audience Chitachi was a guest and so was Rahajan who has been a, a, a Frequent viewer of our programming remember you can find all our archives on youtube.com slash screenet youtube.com slash screenet s-r-e-e NET. And with that, we'll let everybody get back to their Sundays. And please tune in if you can, live or later, to She's On Call, at She's On Call on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next Sunday. Have a great right? weekend. Next Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we, we're going to be here with Mary Curtis. And then tonight is our positivity show, 9 p.m. Eastern. Thanks very much. There's, there's the positivity show and Mary Curtis. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.